So okay, here we go, guys. Moment of silence. Okay, so this is lab number six. The topic for today would be sensory motor adaptation. We are missing the motor over here, but you can understand because of this course, this has a lot to do with motor. And the first phase of this lab, I'm not going to talk about. So the first, not before I talk about any of these. The thing is, I'm not going to talk about the lab now. This is something that you're going to do on your own based on a paper which is linked with this lab. However, I'm going to give you some hints to how you want to approach this, but at the later section of this discussion. In the first phase, we are going to, I'm going to show you how you want to collect this data uh, and how you're going to use that data. And so the first phase of this data collection would be, as I said, I would need, I'm going to create one data for this entire group that is going to be shared among all the four groups, or five, whatever groups you have. And all of them has to be right-handed. And I need two assistants. And so let me first show you how this is done. The assistants, so the four participants, let's actually see what I'm kind of doing here. The target here for me is zero. This is the sticky ball, and my idea is to hit that target with my dominant hand, right hand here. And so whatever result I get, say for instance 15 in my first run, it goes trap first run 15, which is pretest, the normal situation where I don't have anything, like my normal average day grows. So the first 15 trials that I'm going to make goes here. So pretest, it has 15 columns. Each. So I'm going to have my own row over here, Exxon's row of 75 data. Then, the next phase, once I'm done collecting these 15 data, the next phase is the practice phase where I'm going to put on this prism goggles. This is going to somehow twist my vision. How it's going to twist my vision, I'm not going to show it to you guys because I'm, I'm already feeling the after effect of it. But I'm going to give you the data later. So uh, the thing is, this is going to twist my vision somehow. And you're going to see weird things happening. You'll be happy about it because you're going to see how our brain adapts. Uh, but anyways, so for that, we are going to collect 45 <laughs> data wearing that goggle. So SN is still going. Now I'm at 60. 15 plus 45, that's 60. We are done with the practice. I take out the goggles. My assistants are helping me to like take out, because the idea is, which we have to be very careful when collecting the data, is when I stand here, that's it. I'm not moving. I'm not looking anywhere else. Me and the blackboard. That's it. Or the whiteboard, in this case. So we're going to do underarm throws like this. And when I'm done with my first one throws, then I raise my hand like this, and the assistant would give me the second ball. I will not look anywhere else in between pre-test, practice, or post-test. Once I start looking at this, I do not look anywhere else till the 75 trials. In between, when I have to put on the goggles, the idea is simple. I close my eyes. I don't look at my hands, never in this entire experiment. I close my eyes, wear the goggles, open my eyes, start doing this again. Does this make sense? Because this is something that you guys would need to work on. Um, and let's give our data collectors efficient, uh, like decent amount, amount of time so that they have, they can collect the data. And when they like do this, like which is minus 50, somewhere, <laughs> minus seven, or whatever, example, that's an example. So, so in that case, let's, everybody let's shout like saying it's minus seven, like decent amount of shouting, not so high, not so low. <laughs> so, so that being said, and so that everybody has consistent data across the group, and we are going to share that data later, how I'm going to decide on that through an email. You don't have to worry about it. You're going to get the data. Anything else that I miss? I usually miss something. Um, explain the table. Oh, now, if you think about it, your target is at zero. If you sh throw the ball to the left, you're going to get some negative values. What was the way? How did we compute constant error, which gave us information about the direction? It was the measure minus the target. Say, for instance, my, tar uh, my measure was minus 70. 
and my jacket was zero. So minus 17 minus zero is minus 70. So you can understand that constant error computation is something that you don't have to do. Whatever you put over here, based on this, is directly giving you the constant error. Because your target is zero. Do you think it makes sense? So, so whatever you get from here is directly the constant error for you guys. Now that being said, you will have one 75 data set for SI. Then you have 71 data set for SI number one, or SI number two, and carry on, or some for other cases, some other names, uh, which I'll find out later, but not in the video. Uh, so we have like four, pe five people over here, with each having their own happy role, with 75 data. Then for each trial, we have four, five datas. We add for all these datas, <coughs> For trial number one, we add all the data, divide by the number of people. If you include my data, you'll have five. If you don't include my data, you have four. So it depends. So you have an average constant error. Not any error, but your very happy, friendly, constant neighborhood error. So that's it. That's for trial number one. Then you move on to trial number two, and so on and so forth, till 75, and then you're done computing the average constant error across the trials. Does this make sense still now? Now, when you're done with that, the last phase is simple. You have your x-axis where you have the trials, and your y-axis with the average value corresponding to each trial. So your x-axis starts from 1 to 75, your y-axis having individual corresponding averages. And the average, as I said, again and again, stressed it. I hope I've stressed enough. It's our friendly constant error, which gives us information about the direction. And you will see there are some wonderful patterns showing up. And this pattern should look like the pattern that is shown in this PDF. Now, in this PDF, the pattern that we are showing is created by the command called scatterplot. This is something that you want to like look into Google to see how you're going to use scatterplot to Excel. But at the end, your data has to look like this. And if there is something different, you'll have to say you're making it wrong. However, when you make this table, please make sure that sometimes I make bigger. Uh, <laughs> okay, so when you are plotting this data, make sure this data represents your actual average data. Because sometimes you select a wrong button in like a long wrong option in Excel. And what happens is your entire graph dot gets distorted just because you clicked the wrong thing. So just see whether this data represents your actual data. Make sure you have labels and good other good all those good, good things. Now let's make a checklist. Okay, so this one down, this one down, this one down, share, ribbon share, fire it up, Excel. How to use the data, talked about it. Uh, explain the table, did that. Explain the target, target being zero for us. Explain the graph, I did that. Uh, start data collection, which we are gonna start almost now. And anything else? Do you guys have any questions? Till now. No? Wonderful. So, let's start.